Welcome to the Startup Grind. All right, uh, Startup Grind actually in Kalamazoo was started uh, in October. So this is our third interview. We interviewed Jack Aaron, who's a venture capitalist in town for the first interview. The second interview was actually with Charles Berkeley with Abraxas, and tonight we have Kevin Romeo with Rhino Media. Startup Grind is actually a bigger group. It has over 50 cities. It was started in Silicon Valley by Derek Anderson and a couple of others, like Francisco Cruz. And actually it's been going for about three years. And we actually have the global startup grinds that will come up next week out in Silicon Valley. So um, you have this thing kind of taken off to where it's about educating, inspiring, and connecting. So you actually have the food and mingling uh, early on. We'll have the fireside interview with Kevin. Where's and the fire? Oh, I forgot to bring that. We had the cold outside, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Too cold. <laughs> sure, sure. Okay. So the, the fireside would be... Uh, that make him relax. So it takes about 10 or 15 minutes to get into it. And then after that, Kevin will start to, to really jive, right? Warm up? Uh, yeah. I generally try to give a, a caveat to any time somebody listens to me talk. The first 15 minutes is super awkward and a lot of mumbling and run-on sentences. Uh, and then once, about halfway through, uh, people start to warm up to me. And by the end, people like me. So stay with me. <laughs> That's... <laughs> See, just like that, that was awful, <laughs> the whole thing, so. So the goal here, right, is actually to have entrepreneurs that are local to talk about their history, their story, about where they've come from, where they envision Kalamazoo going forward, <coughs> and then learning from that. We'll spend about 30 to 45 minutes where I'll actually talk to them, ask questions, and then open up to you all for about 15 or 20 minutes. So it'll be about an hour session, and then afterwards, uh, Kevin will hang out and, and answer other questions that you want. Uh, Kevin is actually with Rhino Media. He actually co-founded it in 2010, so you're four plus years old. And yep. he actually is a Western uh, grad and uh, graduated in 2006. Dude, you got it. All right, so, so. he's gonna kind of talk about uh, where he came from, uh, from childhood all the way to now. He's actually got a lot of notoriety. Most people know the Michigan Beer Film, which was actually, um, basically uh, delivered uh, to the the uh, screen uh, in October, November? Uh, we had our, sorry, we had our September showing uh, was the initial uh, date um, in Kalamazoo, and then took a few weeks to kind of tweak the dials on the film, and then we started doing other showings, so, yes. Very good, so we'll lead into that, but first of all, okay, I want to find out, Kevin, what has gotten you to Rhino Media today? What's the story behind Rhino? Are we starting? You're starting. That's it? Okay. Let me put the coffee in. <clears throat> How's everything look on camera, guys? Make me look thin? All right. Gorgeous. Can you repeat the question? What has gotten you to this point, Kevin? <clears throat> What's your story, your background? Just, okay. So, <clears throat> um, met up with John the other day, and um, we kind of talked through some of this stuff, so hopefully I stay somewhat on point. Um, so, I'll just kind of do a, a brief version of my history if I can, um, if that provides some good context. Not that it's that exciting, but just so you can kind of know who I am. Yeah, so, <clears throat> uh, I grew up in a small town, uh, kind of a rural lifestyle. Um, I didn't necessarily live on a farm, but I had like a horses and stuff. I don't know what to call it. I like a ranch. I lived on a ranch. So um, that was kind of that. And uh, I was always a little bit of a black sheep. I was a pretty good kid for the most part. Um, growing up, I was kind of naturally a little bit bright when I was a kid. Um, and then as I got older, uh, I, I just got worse and worse grades. I was never that bad. but. Um, <clears throat> I think when I look back on it, it's kind of cool that I can identify what really went wrong. Um, and it really was like I became kind of prideful as I got older, like people do sometimes. But So I was naturally kind of bright, but then as I got into high school, like I never wanted to admit that I needed help, basically, or like would ask the teacher for anything. I just thought, I'm too smart for that. Um, I don't care if my grades are slipping. I justify it in some way. So anyway, that's just good for me, you know, kind of therapeutic why that went down south. Um, so um, 
after uh, high school, I kind of just fell into going to Western, like I think a lot of people do. Not to knock Western, I actually I, I'm a fan of Western, um, but I think in this area, a lot of people kind of default to Western. Um, so, and uh, I really didn't know what I wanted to do. I had a lot of skills, like in areas that basically I could never hope to find a job was my mindset. So I was kind of good at baseball and some athletic stuff, but I was not good enough to go pitch for the Tigers, which was my pipe dream. And then uh, I was also pretty good at art and like painting and drawing and things like that. Um, but, you know, I thought you could really only be an art teacher if that's what you do. And I always thought art teachers were super weird. So um, that was out. And then the other one was I was really into music and I was pretty good at music. I thought I had a good like kind of understanding socially of what made music tick for people and whatnot. But I wasn't I was an average trumpet player, average guitar player, average bass, you know, I just kind of fiddled with stuff. So but I liked all those things and I had no hard skills. Uh, my dad was a really wonderful man. He was a really loving father, but he was like completely um, not the type of guy who could fix anything or like show me how to work on cars. So I grew up not really knowing anything of those typical man skills. Um, and I'm still not that good at that stuff either. So just a really kind of like the average kid that didn't have a lot of anything to really bank on. My parents didn't push me in any one direction. Um, so as I got to college, I just started um, finding my way, like a lot of people kind of start swimming. Um, thought about teaching. Um, and I took a few uh, semesters um, doing like p physical education. Um, and uh, to me, that started to become kind of a dead end because I just didn't like the idea of having a ceiling or feeling like that's really all I can do is be a teacher. Not that that's not a wonderful thing, but I have this thing where I just didn't want to be constricted. And uh, for whatever, whatever it's worth, I didn't like that. So I fell into business because I thought well, that would give me the most opportunities. Uh, it won't really cage me in. I can kind of do whatever. I can. Seems like that's something where a guy like me with not a lot of tangible skills could do something. So uh, that, um, yeah. Should I stop or do? I'm supposed to get to Rhino. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's a big first call. question. Um, since actually you and I talked uh, last. Hyperventilating. Week. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. All right. Breathe, breathe, all right. Yep. There's people here, man. All right. Close your eyes, all right. Envision where you want to be right now. Anywhere else. <laughs> I'm just joking. I'm just kidding. Sorry. So um, you and I talked, and you know, basically, you know, what you're leading to is, you know, you 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 wanted skills, but you didn't necessarily have them growing up. Correct. Did you say skittles? Skills, yeah. Mm -hmm. I wanted skittles. Skills, yeah. Okay. Sorry. So, so you you actually went to Western. You ended up graduating four years. No, five. five Thank years. you. Okay. All right. So um, now, and it's in management by default. Yeah. Um, I can actually talk about that a little bit. So I fell into business, but then for me, management kind of seemed like a good, uh, it's kind of crazy, it's silly how these little life things play in your life, but my whole life I was a big Tigers fan, and I was a just, they were terrible my whole life. And I was like, you know, all these players came through and I was a big fan, and I'd go to the games, my mom would take me to spring training even, and, and we'd go see them and stuff, and they were always like the worst team in the majors. and. Uh, and in college, what was a miracle happened is they started winning, like my junior year or something. It was like when Pudge Rodriguez came and uh, Kenny Rogers and all that stuff. And all of a sudden, they were going to the World Series, and Jim Leland was a big deal. And it was like it was like a paradigm shift in my life. And um, I started reading about Jim Leland because I was like, why is it he's taking the team? You know, what is it about his managerial style that's helping the team? And obviously, other things played a factor. But I thought that's interesting, and I read a lot about how Jim Leland's managerial style was um, very much um, that he had a, like, an, uh, if you're into strengths finder, he was like individualization and he was good at pulling out everyone's individual skills and characteristics and traits and make them unique. And uh, he played on that really well. Like he, he didn't treat everyone the same. Like some coaches are like, my way the highway, do it this way, this is the system. And there's merits to both, but. <clears throat> um, so I was always, I was really intrigued by Jim Leland. I thought, that's cool, because I feel like that's kind of how I am. Like, I, I see people as different and unique, and, and like, I see how that's a good managerial style, and it kind of got me thinking about um, management. You know what I mean? Not that that greatly influenced my decisions, but that was like kind of a uh, person I looked to as a, uh, somebody I could admire the way that they handled 
that type of duty. So. So have you read the book uh, Moneyball? I watched the movie. Okay. So did you like the movie? I like the movie. All right. Yeah. So that's baseball. And that's management. Mm -hmm. That's numbers. Yep. And how do you do a num with numbers? I'm, I don't like numbers. I'm not a big numbers guy. I'm an art guy. I'm not a science guy as much. I, I have an insecurity that I want to be a numbers guy, but I'm just not that much. Rhino's doing well. We pay our bills. We're growing, but I don't. I'm not a. I don't sit there and play with numbers. Go obsessive about numbers, yeah. So you can hire someone for that, right? Yeah, that's what I did. <laughs> now, you graduate from from Western, mm -hmm. and you go into banking. That's I did numbers, right? Yep, that was sales. Okay, but yeah. So, but the people think banking is numbers, right? I think they do. So, so why did you go to banking? Oh, okay. I got, I got you. You know, I know you're doing okay. So. <laughs> He's a good interviewer. Um, so um, at the end of college, uh, I'll go into my personal life a little bit too to kind of weave through this, but um, at the end of my college time, um, and just to give some context of time frame, this is when Facebook was coming out and it was new. Um, so 05, um, like he said, graduated in 06. But at the end of college, I started dating a girl and we ended up gotten, getting serious and I got married before I graduated college, which some people do and some people don't. Um, Kind of rare, felt rare when I was doing it. Um, but anyway, um, at the time, I got out of college and she didn't have a great job, it was an okay job. Um, but I, I graduated and there was a pressure to get a job right away. And um, what I learned later is that, or what I realized through that is that um, it forced me to make a decision I probably wouldn't have, probably wouldn't have made. It's kind of like, um, it cornered me into making a decision that I, I didn't feel like was right, but it was kind of like I had to do it for my family. So at the time it was a noble cause, I had to do it. But looking back, a big part of um, a big part of who I am is I always just look at every situation as a learning opportunity. I try not to ever complain about anything, or I just try to think through why this is good for me, or what, what I can take away from this. And my takeaway from that was <coughs> um, that um, when you don't have enough options because of situations that you're in, uh, you, sometimes you can make poor decisions or untimely decisions. And I, I liken that to having a lot of debt. It's like when you have debt, you have to make decisions that you wouldn't make otherwise if you had the freedom to make, to have a wider variety of decisions. Um, so that, that's kind of a big part of who I am. But <clears throat> do you want me to keep going? Okay, I'll just keep on going. So, um, you know, I don't make a big deal of this. You won't hear me tell this to a ton of people, but I'm not married to that girl anymore. Um, it didn't end well. Just for you guys to know, on my integrity's sake, I didn't leave her anything. Um, she actually ended it and blah, blah, blah. I don't, not at all here to hash through that, but I just wanted to say that um, for me, I, I value marriage tremendously. I'm married now. My wife is a, a fantastic woman. So, and a newborn, too. And I have a newborn baby. My wife is not a newborn. I have a newborn baby. Um, so, so um, my, my current, my wife is an absolute gem. I treasure her. She's fantastic. And my baby's awesome. So that's that, um, I, and I don't want to just nutshell that, but um, I only say that she left me, my first wife left me because I believe in the value of marriage, I believe in integrity. Um, I, I didn't end marriage, I don't, you know what I'm saying? So just to put that out there. <coughs> um, so anyway, I stayed at the bank job for a little bit, and when I say bank job, I'll just bear my soul right now. It was a telemarketing job, and the crazy thing about it was, and I think like half of Kalamazoo's worked at the, the call center on 9th Street at some point, so whatever. Um, but I've been there with a job you hate, probably to the most degree, because I think when you go see friends and stuff, <laughs> Dan's looking at me because he, he, he's had jobs he hated too, we talked about it. But um, <clears throat> you know, when you go see friends you haven't seen in a while, and they're like, how's it going? I don't want to talk to you. I don't want to talk, I don't want to talk. So what are you doing these days? I'm working at a bank. What do you do? I'm like, I, I, I gotta go. You know, that's what it's like. So, um, if you guys are, you know, I can I can connect with you if you hate your job. Um, we'll talk about that later. Um, but anyway, so I was working that job, and I, you know, after things crumbled apart with my my marriage there, um, I. I kept the job for a little bit. I stayed strong in it. I was making pretty good money at the time, so I was like, I, I can roll with this. I, I have a good influence here with some of these people. Like, I'm making good relationships in here to some degree. 
Um, and I kept a good head on my shoulders. Um, <clears throat> so it was good, but I ended up going, you know what? No, I hate this job. I'm not going to stay here anymore. I don't have any reason to be here anymore. I got to leave. So I saved up enough money to have a few months of floating cash. Um, and then I quit. And so after that, I had a long road. So this is where John and I were talking. There's a gap of time after I graduated college, quit that job up until about 2010 when Rhino started where I really just, I kept doing this and um, it's kind of like that thing where at the time I thought every, there was like a low point and I thought, man, this, this sucks. I don't think it's gonna get worse and it'd get worse and things just kind of going like that. Um, so in that time I didn't have any job that uh, was like a degree job or anything like that. I had no connections and that kind of goes back to me being um, raised on a farm in a small town my mom delivered mail for a living. My dad, most of my life when I was a kid, was a grocery store clerk. Um, so I had zero connections in life, for the most part. Um, so it was like, I felt like when I got out of college, I had the, you know, the, the rug pulled out, is that the phrase? Where you're like, holy crap, there's nothing here. I don't know anyone, I gotta go find a job somehow. And uh, I, got, I got kind of a chip on my shoulder because it felt like a lot of, if, you know, a lot of people from Western, it's like, People from the east side come over, they come here and party, they go back home, they got a job at Quicken Loans, like that. And I was like, I don't have any connections. I don't know anyone, I don't have any, like there's no friends of networks of anyone I can glean on, so. Um, and I'm not trying to say like, oh, I'm a self-made man, or trying to puff that up in any way, but I'm just saying that was a hard lesson to learn is you, you have to just go out and start going after what you wanna do, so. <coughs> Um, so, so let's talk about planning. Yep. Right. So, you know, how much planning did you go into uh, when you left the banking job? How much planning did you go into when you end up um, talk about going to, uh, um, you know, um, graduate and, and figure out the uh, the banking job in the first place? And then, how much planning did you put into starting right now? Uh, I didn't put a lot of planning into a lot of those things. Is that we? Okay. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't. Um, <laughs> I was like, I don't know if I said I did before, but I didn't. So um, really it was like, um, I quit that bank job just thinking, I'll find another job somehow. But I didn't have a lot of money, so I went back living at home. Um, I had been renting a house, you know, and whatever. So um, kind of just went after it. And I worked a few jobs that were really rough. Um, actually, the first job I had after the bank thing was... Uh, a guy I knew through like a, a basketball, like a church thing, um, we had a concrete company and he was a terrible business owner. I hope he doesn't watch this video. He's a nice guy, I appreciated that, that he gave me a job at the time, but it was just a low paying concrete laborer type thing. And I thought this would be good, I could do some manual labor for a while and clear my head. Um, but I hope he never watches this recording. But like he was... We'll cut it out, right? We'll cut that part out. Nah, we'll leave it in. So, um, he every, it seemed like every job we went to, I felt the weight of the customer already not liking him. And like, I felt like I'm in the middle. I'm like, I, I'm not, I don't know this guy. I'm not part of this. I don't want to be a part of this. So, and it felt like every job we finished, there was like miscommunications and unclear expectations and you didn't do this right and blah, blah, blah. And the last project I ever did for him was he, somebody hired him to like tile their deck or something like that. And like I said, I'm not a handy guy. I said that earlier. And he just hired me to do it. And I'd never done it before. And he just showed me how to do a couple of them and left for the week. And I had to do it. And so that was really scary. And the guy was mad about that. And I'm, he's mad at me. And I'm like, I don't know. I just got told to do this, man. So leave me alone. But anyway, that job was cool because I was able to observe someone who I thought, this is not how I'd run a small business. I, I don't know how I'd run a small business exactly, but this is wrong. And he'd call people on the phone and leave messages that were just rambly and didn't make any sense. And it was like, I, they can't understand you even when you're talking like that. So he had kind of a southern accent too, and it just was hard to listen to him. So, so you had a concrete job? Yeah, yeah. And then you actually learned from that, right? I, well, I learned what not to do, basically. But then um, you went on to landscaping. Yep. And so then uh, this guy who was actually like one of the, he was like a part-time pastor at this church I was going to, and he also owned this landscape design company. It was a really well-regarded landscape design company. His work was fantastic, very high-end. He didn't do like lawn mowing or anything like that. He just did new landscape design and installation stuff. So I got to work for him. He offered me a job, and uh, 
I was like, cool, this will this will be an interesting opportunity. And like the first day in the job, I could immediately see all these fantastic displays of ways that he was a much better business owner, much more respectful and respectable, a much better communicator. And it was like night and day difference, even though they're kind of in the same industry to some degree. Um, <clears throat> and I felt so much better about life. I was like, I can, I can follow this guy. He's a good, good management guy. He's a good leader. And I just considered it, you know what? I don't want to do landscape design, but I do want to do business ownership at some point. I'm just going to consider this like a mentorship and I'm going to work my butt off for this guy because he's a great guy. So I learned a ton from him about just client expectations, being very clear um, with your communication, um, <clears throat> being patient with people and um, not assuming the worst and just like having that attitude of uh, service and not um, an attitude of trying to get the most money you can and get the hell out of there. Like that was like what the other guy was all the time. So, um, and, and again, I, the guy's not a bad guy, but he's a bad business owner. So, um, so, so you have the, you have the concrete. I'm, I'm not even to Rhino yet. That's right. It will get there. So what happens is these are learning moments and yep. actually we'll talk about how you brought them into Rhino. Right. Yep. So you basically go on to teaching, correct? Oh yeah, yeah. So, so you go on to teaching. Sorry. And I was thinking about how you dropped those papers and if I should help you, but I no, got you're good. I'll, I'll get them. Okay. Later, so. <laughs> Sorry. But but the, the teaching aspect. Mm -hmm. So we've got bad management. We have good management. Yep. Now let's go and talk about the teaching. Okay. So the landscape job was great for a, a, a few seasons of life kind of thing. I worked for them in the summers and it was nice, and then I'd have the winter, and I didn't really have anything going on. Um, and I think a lot of people, when they get out of college, they fall back on substitute teaching, and I definitely did that. Um, which, again, I took it as a good opportunity, um, although the pay rate for a day of substitute teaching is $66. So even if I worked five days a week, it was like very little money, um, especially when you have a college degree. And there's always that thing in the back of your mind, like you have a degree, why are you substitute teaching? What else can you be doing with your time? Um, but anyway. So I took that as an opportunity to um, grow my um, ability to win over an audience, which um, is really hard. I mean, I basically looked at it like every day I'm going to come in, and I can't think of a harder to impress crowd than a bunch of ninth graders or tenth graders. And I have seven or six hours where they're going to cycle through, and it's a whole new class in 48 minutes or whatever. And worst situation you can ever be in to have people like or respect you is being a substitute teacher. So I thought. If I can get really good at this and get people to like me in this little bit of time I have, there's no way I can't like work over a crowd in any situation and just make friends. Um, and it ended up going really good. Uh, I actually really started to like substitute teaching. It was kind of a thing though. I kind of had this thing like God was playing tricks on me and like toying with my emotions because I, I got offered three different jobs while teaching, substitute teaching, and I couldn't take them, although I was desperate for a real job. Um, but I couldn't take it because I wasn't certified as a teacher. And they're like, you're really good. Like, we want to hire you. Uh, can you, can you be a teacher here? And I'm like, no. Screw you. So, um, <laughs> anyway, it was just a great opportunity for me to learn and grow again and say, um, you know what? Hey, this is where I am in life right now. I'm going to make the best of it, and I'm going to connect with these kids and, and impact their lives in a positive way. And so we'd always get off subject, and I, I didn't want to be that sub who was just completely negligent for the teachers instructions either so I'd make sure I did what I had to do but I'd also open up a lot of dialogue kids love to talk to me about whatever I mean and of course when they're talking about that stuff they're not working on their schoolwork but I thought this is a good opportunity to talk to them about like credit card debt and uh, drug use and just real stuff that they, they want to know about and I'd say yeah, I'd give them some advice and stuff and now it's cool because I mean ask my wife ask anybody we go out to dinner Chin Chin in Matawan I did a lot of subbing in Matawan all the waitresses and waiters know me and they're Miss Romeo. Like every time they're so excited to see me. I see bus boys at our bellies and waiters at all these little restaurants and I, I it's everywhere I go. And they're like, dude, you were the best sub ever. We like and the and the cool thing was like the kids like me, but the teachers always like really like me too. So I, it wasn't just like me letting the kids clown around or whatever. So there's your network right there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Who are you? Still in high school. Huh? Oh, you're a high schooler? <laughs> oh, I was going to say, were you one of them? All right. Cool. So we're not to Rhino yet. Nope. Right? Nope. But we're almost there. Almost this there. Goes back to now the last piece of the puzzle, and that's actually KBCC, right? Yeah. Well, kind of. The timing's a little jacked up. I went back to school after college, 
uh, after the divorce. I went back to school because I thought I always I want to tap into my artistic side of things. I always wanted to do that, and I started understanding that the Center for New Media teaches careers and things like graphic design and photography and and uh, animations and stuff. So. I was like, I'm gonna go back to school for that and add that on to my bachelor's, and which was kind of cool because at the time, some of the KBCC teachers were like, you have a really great combo. Like, I don't think you know this yet, but the fact that you're like business trained or whatever, and you're gonna go do this this kind of, you have a real leg up that a lot of these art kids are never gonna understand. And uh, it's kind of cool to see that now because now Rhino's like a thriving kind of business just down the street from KBCC where I was trying to figure out my, my life kind of thing. So. Um, but again, I didn't actually go through with taking all the classes at KBCC because um, I didn't want to spend money I didn't have and I wasn't going to take on debt because I had a bunch of student loan debt. And I, I was at that point in my life, which I still am, just vehemently opposed to taking on more debt in, in an effort to get that. So, <clears throat> so anyway, I quit that, um, but I started um, taking photography more seriously because I did it a lot as a kid and like just slowly get into like graphic design which I'm not a good graphic designer really but I and I'm not trained as a graphic I mean apologizing to anyone that's a graphic designer here because I'm not but I, I um, generally have a good eye for what's socially relevant or what might connect with a crowd kind of thing but I'm not the guy to what do about that. the guitar playing on the stage at the uh, premiere so that was dumb uh, <laughs> at the beer film premiere we did I had in an effort to gain more sponsorship money, I had said, I'll sing your name of your business in a song, and it'll be fun. And I'd sing around. We, I played a lot of gigs and stuff, so I was like, that should be no problem. And, uh, but then what, the, the week coming, the couple weeks coming up to it, I was like, why did, I, I mean, I really was sweating. Like, this was dumb. I, this is going to be a laughing stock. Why did I say I was going to do that? But I ended up saying, I'm going to have my buddy Colin come play, because we play a lot of gigs in the past. And uh, so him coming up in there helped me, and I had to, write this song, and I thought it came out pretty good, actually. It ended up being kind of fun. People clapped a lot, so that it was nice. Did, yeah. yeah. You so, wanted the audience there. I thought so. I thought people loved it. I mean, whatever. If you didn't love it, get out of here. <laughs> 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 All right, so, so you have the design skills <clears throat> now. Why start Rhino Media, and what is Rhino Media? OK, so all right, at this point, I can pretty much get to when we started Rhino. Lowest point in my life, I don't want to leave this one little part out. Um, again, having a college degree, there's a lot of, there's not, uh, there's not too many jobs that are obvious to the average person trying to find jobs. You know what I'm saying? Do you want me to point at the camera or anything? <laughs> Here, take it, I'll do it. Okay, I'm just kidding. Um, but like, there's not a lot of jobs. And when you're, when you're not in the industry or whatever, there's like Stryker, Pfizer, there's a the Target Distribution Center you can apply at. They take a lot of people. And uh, banks. There's not much else to the average person. It's not like in the mix. Um, so I got rejected by all those people, um, applied them all. I even had some connections to some of them that I'd made throughout the last the few years. I got rejected. I don't know why. I'm a bad interviewer. I don't know. Our interview we had, I'm just not good at it. Um, I don't make a lot of good eye contact. So, um, and it was demoralizing. Like, and this is another thing I connect with people on. Like, if you've got a degree and you're applying for jobs and you're not getting them and you want to cry, guess what? I've been there, so if you want to talk, we'll talk later. Um, so at that low point, everything's like, I can't figure out what the heck I'm going to do in life. So um, a, a buddy of mine who I'd lived with um, in the past had a little mini video production company that really probably wasn't going anywhere, and he knew it. Um, he and another friend of mine uh, were getting together, and they wanted to do like kind of scrap that whole thing and start a new company, and they wanted to call it Rhino Media. <clears throat> and I was like, why do you want to call it Rhino Media? And there's like, there's a whole thing with Rhinos. Um, the guy who had the other production company, um, he loved Rhinos because the whole thing with Rhinos is their eyesight's poor and their horns on their face make it so they can't see in front of them real well. And when they're running at top speed, uh, you know, they can't break very quickly either. So when they're running at top speed, if a big massive tree gets in their way or something, a lot of times they'll just crash into it. Um, so it, it, it gives you a lot of cool metaphors about life and how um, even though we can't always see what's in front of us, we're kind of like blindly running forward on faith of what we're supposed to be doing with our lives and just crashing forward. So we were like, I was like, that's a great meaning. I'm going to roll with that. I like that. Rhino Media. And one of the guys who's still a part of Rhino Media, he wanted to spell it R-Y-N-O. And I was like, that's so dumb. 
I'm not going to do it if you do that. But we spelled it R-H-I-N-O, I'm in. So I joined in. <clears throat> that was supposed to be kind of funny, but it, no one responded. <laughs> so we met at a Pizza Hut and Papa talked about it, kind of came up with what we want to do. And the idea is really simple, just photo, video. And with the, um, with the kind of the, uh, the big changes with DSLR camera technology, that made it so like that was possible to really invest in you know Canon 70s and 5D Mark IIs. Well, Mark II hadn't come out yet, but anyway. Um, what was the Michigan beer film shot with? Uh, the Michigan beer film was shot almost entirely with 5D Mark II or 5D Mark III, um, but I did buy a Canon C100 toward the end of it, and we did a couple shoots with that. So there's, I can't quite say it's all DSLR. But anyway, um, Rhino started, and uh, basically it was, it was just, you know, for me, it was like, I don't care what, nothing's gonna stop me from pouring everything I have into this because this is something I can take and run with. And it was kind of a cool moment because um, there's a few months leading up to actually my wedding with my wife, which is another reason why she's so amazing because she loved me when I had nothing. Um, and not that I have riches now, but she's, she loved me when there was like no job attached to my name and no, no one gave a crap about me kind of thing. Um, and, uh, and, and she's very humble and she doesn't care. Um, you know, people write articles about what we're doing or the beer film. It doesn't impress her at all. So that's why she's great. But anyway, um, so we started Rhino and it was very humble beginnings. It was like shoot weddings and do photo and video and kind of play around with that and just kind of find our way. And uh, the guy who had the company previously, his name is Justin, um, he was kind of the boss at the time. Not really on paper, but it was like kind of implied like he's done this before. He's has some experience in some of this stuff. And about th four or five months into it, he was just kind of going off in different directions and seemed like he wanted to do something else with his life almost already. It's very entrepreneurial in his mindset. Um, but I kind of just said, you know what? I feel like I have a lot of drive and I, I have my business degree and I know that doesn't qualify me to do anything special, but I really would like to put some of those skills in place. And like this is something I, I think I could really sink my teeth into. I was like, what do you think about just letting me run this thing and you just step back. And it, it was really kind of that simple. And he was like, I, I feel the same way. So it's kind of how it got going. Um, and from there, I just, I dug into every book I could read, um, having mentors and uh, just applying every good principle I know about life and truths I believe about life and the way you should treat people and the way you should handle a client and always give people the benefit of the doubt and don't assume the worst. and. Um, you know, deliver things as you say you're gonna deliver them and do not ever, um, you know, if you, if you promise something, follow through with that even if it kills you. Um, learn the lessons along the way. If you make a mistake, don't do it twice. All those types of things I just like saturated our company with and like how we think about things. Um, and so yada, 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 we got Rhino Media. What I'm gonna do is we've actually set up the audience really nicely here, Kevin. I'm actually open up to questions right now for you all. So um, I have more questions, but uh, I want to kind of get you guys to, to chime in here because now we're sitting at Rhino Media and Michigan Beer Film, and so you can ask specific questions. Any questions at this moment? Julie. Who was your first big client? Um, Who was your first big client? I don't know. I don't know if we even have a big client now. We got a variety. Um, you can hold it. You got a lot of energy because you're in high school. You can hold that mic. Um, so, um, I, I don't know. The first client, I, I have a good answer to that. So we were doing weddings and stuff, and then how we got into commercial stuff was not a huge thing, but we were like, we had some ideas for Taco Bob's. We were like, I think it'd be cool. We could kind of, and this is how naive we were, like, we should pitch that idea to Taco Bob's. I don't know who we talked to, but like, we can find their email or something. And so, we just had this idea to do like a stand-up comedian who's dressed like a big taco, and we wanted kind of a heavy set guy to be funny, and you know, just because he's a, a fat guy in a taco suit, whatever. But the guy who did it was a friend of ours, and he's a really good actor, and um, we said, we think it'd be cool to do like a stand-up comedian where he's like trying to tell jokes and they're not funny, and then it'd be like, that's not a funny taco, we have funny tacos. So we thought that idea was hilarious, and then we just pitched a Taco Bob's, and our prices were dirt cheap at the time, so they are like, that sounds great, let's do it. So we made a commercial and like got a good response and you know gave us some enthusiasm and confidence that we could do it again. And so that's 
as naive as it started, that's how it started. Like, we got an idea, let's tell them. And our prices, I think we probably charged them like 500 bucks, which at the time was like, that's a good gig. So um, that's, how, that's how we got into commercial work. So you initiated you know it? Yeah. No, no one would ever come to us because we didn't have anything to come to. So um, it was just like, but I, we came with an idea. We came with like, you know, and that's, you want to be careful. You don't want to come to people and say, hey, here's a good idea for your business. Because I personally kind of get annoyed when people do that. Like, you should do this. You know what I'm saying? To me, it's so some social unawareness when you're coming at people like that. Like, okay, you don't even know my business. Don't, don't try to tell me what I need to do. Not that I'm prideful too much on that, but it, you know what I'm saying. Um, and I think we, we approached it kind of humbly and just said, hey, we love your product. I, I love the funny taco. We think it'd be kind of cool. You guys ever done a commercial? I, I didn't think so, so it just worked out. Um, and then since then, we've had some big uh, like kind of spikes where we've had a big client jump or something. So another big one was um, uh, another thing that's happened in the last five years is like these crowdsourcing your video projects. And there's lots of sites that like facilitate that. And we got on one of them for a while and we don't really do it anymore because they don't they take too much time and not really worth it after a while but when you're young they'll promise like hey if your video gets picked you get 10 grand or something and that at the time is like do that and that's still a good paying gig for something you could kind of execute quickly um but the chicago white Sox were running one and we won a competition by them and so immediately I don't go around saying like they're our client per se but I'm like we've done work for the chicago white Sox. it aired on national tv games White Sox versus Yankees. People in Colorado saw it, had our name on it, because it was part of this whole thing they are doing with crowdfunding the whole thing, or crowdsourcing the video project. So people were like calling and texting, I, I, saw, the, I saw your commercial in, uh, all over the country. So that's a huge thing, and I'm a big baseball fan. I hate the Sox, but it was cool to make a spot spot. No offense, <laughs> anybody, I'm a Tigers fan. So it was really hard to do it, because I was like, I hate the Sox, but I want to win. So. Um, that was that was a big bump, and I think people all of a sudden like, dude, that Rhino, they made a spot for the Sox. That's cool. Like that was a big talking point for a while. Um, I would say up until the beer film really got going, it was still the thing that people always went back like, you did that spot for the Sox. That's awesome. So and it ran all summer long in 2012 in WGN all the Sox games. So that was really cool. Um, and then now it's like, you know, it's just cool to say, uh, and I didn't say this before, but my funny little thing I like to say is when Rhino Media started I was sleeping on a couch in a studio apartment with a friend and like nothing to my name kind of thing um, and to go around and see all these big cool things you could be a part of in Kalamazoo and now like Bells is come on we do we do work for Bells I have a relationship with Bells they're like a client to me like that's a national brand I love their product I love I love who they are um, to think that they're a client of mine is pretty awesome you know what I mean so there's always those, I, I just want to make a company that's like full of fun people that do great work and are committed to excellence and then other people want to be a part of that too. So I just want to work with brands I like. So a lot of the breweries, I like working with breweries. Um, you know, we don't, I don't know, there's a lot of video production work out there to do work for like radiology clinics and stuff. And like I'd do that if they ever came to me, but I, I don't get those clients. I get the clients that are like, kind of like me and they want to do stuff like I want to do. So if you have a radiology clinic, I'll, I'll do a video for you or something. But um, How many videos did you do last year? Uh, last year, I actually never counted our videos before, but we always do this thing at the end of every year. We just kind of do a, hey, let's take a look at the year. Let's, let's see how we did with um, some of the things we said we want to do. Not that we don't talk about them throughout the year, but just a big year-end meeting. And uh, I counted the videos that we did. And a rough estimate, we did at least 250 260 videos which is like five or six a week or something five a week pretty awesome and you don't think it's you're cranking them out that fast but it's just unbelievable how things have grown and uh so yeah that was a big you said client big client so sir daniel oh yeah hold on don't talk to that it gets there <laughs> gotta maintain order in here <laughs> What's your uh, client mix look like geographically? How much is like right in Kalamazoo, Portage area, and how much is state, and how much is national? Um, I would say I should have this. Is, I'm not a numbers guy. I should know this, but like generally, most of it's Kalamazoo right now. 
We do have some Michigan across the state kind of clients. We have some manufacturing companies like um, down in Indiana, um, over at Farmington, you know, kind of smatterings around. For the most part, we're very heavily centered Kalamazoo. One, because um, that's my, my goal. I kind of consider like the center of culture need is like downtown. Like that's like where culture is, you know, uh, we could put Rhino on the edge of town over on 9th Street or something, get a little strip mall, not strip mall, but you know what I'm saying, like a, a little business park or something. But I feel like we wouldn't have any cultural influence out there. Like if we're downtown, that's where everything kind of happens and we can have an influence and, and kind of spread that, extend that out. So um, we're really heavy in Kalamazoo. We love developing Kalamazoo. One of our like, you know, I'm big into having like a purpose for what you do and not just like, oh, we love to make fun videos. But like one of our big kind of underlying goals and things that would drive us is like, we want to make obviously people's work outstanding and show who they are and let you know their audience connect with who they are. And uh, that's such a big part of today's economy and you know ideology of why people make purchasing decisions. So we're always about showing why companies do what they do, who they are as people, what are the values they care about and that kind of thing. Um, but for us, like we want to, we want Kalamazoo to look really good online. You know what I mean? Like I want when there's a young dude coming out of college, he's thinking about going to work for you know, Striker, Rubbermaid, or whatever. Some of those new hot things happening um, to just see a bunch of great video content about Kalamazoo and the businesses and go, this place looks great. This place looks relevant and hip. There's not a bunch of crappy videos out there because that's really important to people. If they go and look up a company and there's like this video from even five or six years ago now and it's just kind of poorly done and the aspect ratio is like four or three and it just looks shoddy, you're like, I'm gonna go to Ann Arbor. I'm gonna go to somewhere else. So in my mind, that's like kind of one of our noble purposes is like to make Kalamazoo really well represented online. Um, so national clients, um, not a ton. Um, I don't really know how to reach out that well to national clients because there's so many people that do what we do around the country unless you got a connection i don't see a lot of merit in trying that hard to do that especially with the whole thing with rhino the whole time it's been in, in existence is it, it it's about as much as i can handle at any given time okay. i can't really do much more to get more business um, because we're barely making it work like we're always figuring out as we go okay um 250 videos in one year that would have completely broke us in half the year before and next year we'll probably put out 500 videos and they'll be great. But if we did 500 last year, it would broke us. You know what I mean? So I don't actually go out and get any business. I don't go any, I don't do any proactive reaching out. Rarely. If there's like somebody I really want to work with and they kind of seem to be hinting that they might be interested in something or might be looking like they're going to make a move and do something, I might say, hey, what about me? You know, like kind of like that. Just as a fun thing almost. Um, but I don't ever go out and sell. All I do is handle stuff that comes to us, which is super cool. And it's like, God blessing, like I'm not even trying and this thing is like, I can't contain it. So that's cool. I just, I just try to manage our brand, make sure our people are top quality, um, good people, treat people right, and really excellent people. And my team is cool. My team is really great because they're young and they're coming out of college, like these two cats here, Nick and Dan. Um, they're super talented, really nice guys. Um, they're both pretty quiet. They're about the two quietest guys at Rhino, so they're not going to talk for the most part. They hate this. Sorry, guys. Um, but they're, they're very talented, and I like to attract talented people to us. And so we've had a lot of interns come through. Some kind of fizzle out. Some are kind of they don't work out. Some, though, just come in and knock it out, and you're like, this is there's fantastic talent coming out of Western. They, they're attracted to us because we're putting out content that's solid and they want to work for someone that's doing that kind of thing and with the times and updated technology and stuff. So anyway, took that way too far. Sorry. Sir. What gave, what gave you the idea to do the Michigan Beer film? And when you came up with that, what did you think it was going to do compared to what did it actually do? Okay. Um, <clears throat> so the idea for it basically was really simple. I had been thinking... I've always kind of questioned um, how much work is there in Kalamazoo for us to do? 
and it's kind of silly to think back how two years ago I was thinking that, thinking, are we tapped out? Is there, is there enough work to keep us afloat? And now it's like, yes, of course there is. Um, but the idea was like, we kind of need to make our own products. I think that's the key to us growing beyond, uh, beyond just a small little boutique thing. I think we need to make our own film, sell that, have photo products we do and just like uh, like sell prints or books and, and just things that people might want to connect with. Um, so that was like driving me and I was thinking about that a lot. Like what are things that we like a lot that we could do a film about? Or like just something that could be something you sell online and they can sell while you're sleeping. That's a dream. Make money while you sleep. So, um, so we're at our Park Trade Center studio and it's just a little shanty town set up of an office but people are starting to hear good things about us and so we had starting to get some kind of higher end people in the community and I'm like most everyone on the planet in come well everyone in comes you knows Don Jones from Habitat for Humanity and so like Don Jones had heard about us and they were interested in having us do like a capital campaign video and one of the people in the meeting I don't remember her name she's not with them anymore but she said you know you guys should do a video you should do a thing with bells because they're just doing this big expansion and that would be cool I was like, that would be cool. Do you know them? Because I'd love to get a number or something. And uh, she didn't have a number. So I thought, I stewed on that a little bit. I thought it'd be cool. But like, I was like, what if we just, what if we just did a film about the whole state? I mean, this state's blowing up. What if we just did a film about the explosive nature of the industry and what's going on? And that was it. That was the whole cattle, you know, impetus behind it. So. Um, I didn't have a plot. I didn't have anything other than like that's how I want it to feel. That's the idea behind it. That's the the kind of the log line of the film. Let's start shooting. And I had a connection with Greenbush because my father-in-law was uh, really close with the guy who started it, and so he got me connected with them. And they were at a point where they're like, "Yeah, come on in." And uh, the first shoot was such an embarrassment. Like we forgot half this equipment. And it was stupid. I if you know cameras and stuff at all. I forgot my tripod. All I had was a light stand that I like had to spin my camera onto the, you know what I'm saying, the, I don't know anything about this stuff. That's what I was saying earlier. My dad didn't teach me this stuff. Whatever the thing is, that you thread the thing on. Help me out. What's that called? You guys don't know stuff either. All right. Anyway, kind of like that. Nuts and bolts. Um, so the shoot was just a mess. We ended up using one piece of footage from that shoot, but it got my relationship started with Greenbush. They loved how we handled it. I mean, we, you know, and they were great because they were growing so fast. Every time we'd show up, there was something new happened. They busted out a new wall, and just it was always like changing. So that was cool. Um, and then, what was the other part of your question? What you thought it would be versus what it turned. Yes, and so it it ended up being what I pretty much felt like it should be. Like it didn't change as far as like where it would go, but it really did kind of just come together as we went and. Um, if you guys don't know, uh, Nick and Dan, but Nick was like the main editor for the beer film over there. Um, so Nick had a big hand in the feel and the style, but that's what was so cool and kind of just like, I felt like I this guy just like fell like on our lap because I'm, Rhino's growing so fast and all that stuff, I don't always have time to communicate big, big, or, or fine, fine details on a film project. So Nick, I gave him a couple things and said, I kind of want to look like this. Uh, I need to see this and this and this give me something, show me what we can do. And he made a couple little videos and like, dude, that's perfect. And it was like, he had that kind of magic, like this cat gets what I'm talking about and I don't have to give him a lot of details, that's beautiful. And so I just said, I don't know who's gonna edit the film yet. And I said, do you wanna edit the film? And he's like, yeah. So I was like, all right, good. And that's what we did. And so we had a few planning meetings and like, okay, here's all the stuff we've shot so far. What do we have? What else do we need to get to tie it all together? What, what's point A, what's point B kind of thing. And so it just, that's really how it came out. And we were really happy with it. We knew it wasn't gonna be like any expose or dirty dark stuff and oh, look what Larry Bell did. It was nothing like that. But it was just like, we're gonna talk about the industry. There's gonna be some challenges. And uh, obviously there's oversaturation that people talk about a lot. Is that gonna be a problem for Michigan? That type of stuff. Um, but all in all, I felt like this is a craft beer fan movie. If you like Michigan beer, there's no reason you're not gonna like this film. And that's what it was, and so that's kind of how it came out. So, yeah. Noel. Hi, Kevin. Hey. Hi. Uh, so you're a creative guy. 
And Thanks. I'm interested in, in finding out you know, how does the creative process work at Rhino? Maybe when you guys all get together and get a new idea, somebody has to pitch it to you, where do you go from there? That's a good question. At different times in Rhino's life, it's very different. So two years ago, when it was three people, it was very much that, hey, client wants us to make a video. They said, come up with some ideas. Cool, let's get around the table, whiteboard, start throwing stuff at the whiteboard, do a you know, very typical uh, brainstorm type meeting. Throw everything on the board, nothing's dumb. And all right, let's erase the dumb stuff, you know? That type of formula. Now, well, not now. Uh, there was a time where Rhino was growing really fast. I actually, um, I, I had to let, let a guy go for some personal reasons and stuff. And at the time, it was a good decision. Um, I let him go, and that kind of got rid of my pre-production guy, and I took that on. And Rhino's growing really fast, growing really fast. That kind of, we really slowed down the collaborative creative energy at Rhino. I still would pull people in and say, what do you think about this idea? And we'd kind of talk through things. A lot less, though, big creative meetings happened, though, for a while. And it was kind of like whatever came to my head when the client was talking is what we'd execute. And sometimes I hit it out of the park with a good idea. Sometimes it's like, I'm just not feeling anything. And then I'd go to my guy and go, do you have anything? Because I'm stuck. Um, and honestly, all our client relationships, I would say, are pretty solid. Like, I, I can't think of any, honestly, bad client relationship we have. Um, so everyone's really happy with everything we've done. But I know internally we can do better. And uh, the guy that I let go, I actually just rehired him recently after some conversations about things and kind of, I'm a big believer in like second chances and I'm like, I think you've changed. I think some of the things that were happening uh, have been healed and repaired and there's some good stuff going on. And uh, so he's back, which is really exciting because he's super talented and he was a big part of why we got good fast, I guess, for having no experience because um, he brought a lot of experience to the table. So now we're back to having a lot more emphasis on collaboration, pulling people in, hey, let's talk about different ideas for this project. Let's, um, let's look at what's out there. What bag of tricks do we have to pull from? You know, we don't, try to, we don't get hinged on equipment too much. I, know, I never want to be in those production companies like brags about the equipment you have. I think that's kind of dumb. It's really about like what you bring to the table and the style you have and how you execute. Because um, really, you can rent anything you want as long as you know what's out there. Um, but we do have a lot of good equipment either way now. But, um, <laughs> Not to brag, but no, I'm just kidding. So, you know, I try to be real careful on what we buy and what we have. But um, so I think a big part of it is like we're all, we all absorb media. We all watch videos and we all see what people are doing. And we try, we, we try not to let um, our influences be ever like out of fear. Like, oh, did you see what they did? We need to do that, but better. Like, we need to, we need to up our game. If that ever happens, and it does once in a while, like, you kind of get that, like, oh, shoot, see what. Because uh, one big one we all saw, uh, um, Founders Brewing Company put out a video like maybe five months ago or something, and it was a really well done video, pretty high end, and it was like, wow, that was a pretty sweet video. Who made that? And like, that was well done, you know. And you go, you know, good for you, um, but it makes you go, oh, we need to step up our game a little bit. If that's what they're gonna do, and that's what, you know, that kind of tone's being set for that type of production um, in Grand Rapids and stuff. And we definitely. We definitely think like we can be kind of the most sought after creative visual media company in the state and beyond. Um, we're not trying to say like we're better than everybody now, but we definitely think we can grow to that level where people are like, that company Rhino, they're just solid. They are um, great guys, they treat you well, they do what they say they're gonna do, they execute great ideas and everything's just on point, you know what I mean? I think a big problem <coughs> in a lot of creative and Maestro is a great example of a great creative company. It's cool that we're here, but like, there's so many creative companies people want to start. Oh, they make promises and they, oh, this is all the stuff we're gonna do, and then they never deliver. And it's like that's why it's so hard, and you get a bad rap. I actually had a lot of that with the beer film, and the outset was, um, like, I, and I'm not dogging them at all, but the the Brewers Guild in Michigan, I asked them like, hey, we're, I'm thinking about doing this film. What do you guys think about, um, uh, you know, working with me on it or something? Or, and I'm always really careful about that. I don't like to bug people. I'm always like, let me try to do it on my own. Let me build some credibility before I go to you. But at that point, we'd done some shoots and said, could we maybe get some press passes to like Winter Beer Fest? And they're like, after like two weeks of no response, they were like, yeah, we can, here's the thing. 
a lot of people said they're going to do a film about Michigan beer, and they come to the festivals and drink our beer, and no one ever made a movie. And so they were kind of real jaded to that. And we had to deal with that a lot in the front end because that, that's the name of the game a lot of time for creative companies. Like they, they have all this talk, and they talk, and, and they don't deliver, you know? So that's a big part of like Rhino Valley is like we deliver on our promises. We don't say things we're going to do if we don't do them. I'm being like a politician, and I totally went into five other things than what you said, but anyway. Um, so, um, yeah, I think, I think a big part of who we are, though, is just always growing and getting better. So our creative process right now is getting a lot better. It's going to be a lot better in the future. It's going to keep getting better and be refined. You know what I mean? That's how I look at it. That was a pretty bad answer. I'm sorry. One, one more question, and I'll kind of conclude things. But they'll, they'll go make more passage there. So. Hey, you get wait till that microphone gets there. I was wondering when you get five or six or seven creative people together. I know in my company I've had a board, and it's very difficult to resolve all the ideas. How do you resolve the differences, legitimate differences, and a little? We're trying to design a website right now. We have 17 different ideas. Uh -huh. How do you resolve those? So um, I'll, I'll get around to that. Um, one of the things that's kind of a core value that I don't preach a lot, but it's understood at Rhino. Um, I, you know, I listen to like podcasts and read books and Jim Collins and Seth Godin and stuff like that. Um, I don't know who said it, but I remember hearing that, um, like I think it was IBM, they have this thing where if you come to the table and you're an executive in this meeting or whatever, you, if you disagree with what's being said, you have to voice that disagreement. You can't sit idly by and sabotage a project because you don't think it's going to work. That's wrong. Um, and so on, at least on the level of like the guys that have been with me for a long time, they know that I expect that of them. Don't sit there with your mouth shut if you have a problem. We're going to talk about it. Uh, put it all on the table. And uh, argue passionately about our idea, but the bottom line is going to come down to who's making the call. That's me on most things. Uh, not that I um, uh, overuse that power by any means. I'm very much about like enabling people to just make decisions. I mean, hopefully these guys are the test. I just say go ahead and do it. I like it, good and cool. Like I try to give a lot of empowerment to the team, but ultimately they know that my leadership style is like, okay, we're going to talk about this. We're going to take the input in and I'm going to make a decision. If there's no consensus, I'm going to make that decision, be a strong leader, and then you guys have to roll with it because that's, that's what it takes. You can't sit back. You argued your point. Cool. Here's what we're doing. Um, it works well for us. Um, I'm big on feedback. I mean, I ask my team all the time, how do you think things are going? Is there anything you could be doing better with your job? Um, are the things I could be doing better? Does this meeting suck? Do you think I'm doing a good job leading it? Which you know, so I'm big on feedback and just being honest and transparent. I try to keep pride and egos out of the equation, although we're human beings, so that's virtually impossible. But the more you can fight at that um, kind of uh, animal, that whole pride ego thing, and creative stuff, I mean, everybody thinks their idea is the best. We, we know that. Everyone knows that. One of my, my right-hand guy pretty much is a guy named Jer Jeremy. And him and I disagree. We agree socially on the things about life almost 100% of the time. Creatively, we're almost always not in agreement. Um, but we, uh, we talk about it, and we, we just keep that communication open. And um, uh, just the bottom line is your team has to know that you love them, and you appreciate them, and you respect them enough to agree when they're right or, or when, you, when you're going to go their way and disagree when they're wrong. And then the, if they love and respect you back, they'll, uh, you know, They'll be okay with it, and they'll 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 know that what you're doing and um, is for the good of the team and and for the best for everybody. And that's why I always say I actually got in a big what I say heated talk with Jeremy last night after work. Everyone left, and we just like I was like, but don't you see like just please. I, I'm, the final thing we totally hugged it out. It was all good, but um, I said just please know, just always assume the best of me. Don't always, don't don't think that I'm trying to. You know, put you off in the corner or something, or or um, 
you know, marginalize your input on this project, please don't think that. Just know that I'm trying to give someone else a chance or, or you know what I'm saying? So the relationships we have are really strong and that gives a lot of flexibility to be very real, I guess. I don't know if that really helps, but that's how I answered your question. <laughs> so. Still have all the problems to start to with, but you yeah. resolve them, so. Okay. What you just explained, Kevin, was the difference between personality conflict and tax conflict. Yeah. So you actually, you know, don't have any personality conflict with Jeremy, but the tax No, I love the guy. Is that it's, it's how you get something done and what the end product should look like. So yep. task um, conflict is actually pretty healthy to come out with certain things. You actually just, you know, some good on that. Yeah, can, can I tag one more piece on that? Sure. A big another thing, uh, another thing for me with just conflict in general is that um, when you're open and honest with each other and conflict arises, I think conflict is normal. I think if you're not having kind of little conflicts here and there all the time, you're being fake most likely, or you're hiding your real feelings because two people together are obviously not going to agree on everything. If you do, it's crap. You're lying to yourself. Um, you're, you're not digging hard enough to get to the problem or to get to the root. So my thing that I you know, talk to the team about as much as I can is like conflict is normal. It's expected. So don't be upset when it happens. Let's just look at how we can go through it together. Um, and actually with clients too, that's a whole other deal. I'm not going to go into a long spiel on this. But for me, I've actually found that the clients that there's been a problem with, we've had some conflict, you know, you, you think, oh, there's a conflict they're gone or they're not going to work with us anymore if you handle the conflict well they'll never leave because they saw you at the worst they saw when you might made a mistake but we owned up to it we fixed it we you know we fixed the problem we handled it with grace and compassion or patience kindness all those things and now they're like why would i ever go to someone else like you guys i saw you mess it up you handle. i mean that's what that's what you want somebody's gonna not ditch your project or just throw their hands up and call you names and whatever, raise your voice. I've had guys yell and swear at me and like my team was um, like, I like diffuse the situation and now they'll never, like they, they come back to us with 15 more video projects, you know? So it's amazing <coughs> um, what having, having patience and, and um, yeah, that's it. Well, the, the trust factor ends up you know, playing a lot into that. So yeah. we're, gonna, we're gonna wrap up here, right? Kevin will stay. And actually, um, did you say sing? You guys. Did you we say sing? Sing and play the guitar, right? No, I'm not doing that. Okay, next time, right? All right. But but some of the things that uh, you might want to ask him, I mean, he didn't uh, allude on, is that you know, I wanted to bring back the um, why we talked about the early part of his life in terms of the management piece. And he's brought a lot of that in terms of Rhino uh, learning all the time and then teaching as well. So it kind of, if you ask him, okay, what the, the crash on mantra is, like to go into the operating principles and a lot of it deals with you know his previous life uh, before starting you know Rhino and where he got that as well in terms of creating you know, a good environment with the clients. I mean the photoshops are actually fun to be with and not very stressful and that's actually different. Oh yeah, yeah. The value proposition for uh, you as compared to other people that want to do that. And then the crowdfunding piece, okay, in terms of the yeah, so yeah. You know, that's how you actually were able to get over the, the last part of getting that the year and a half project done. So mm -hmm. a, a lot of things you can talk to him about, you know, one on one. So uh, that ends up being there. But I want to end with two questions, and then we'll um, okay. you guys can you know have at it with him one on one. But one is, you know, what would you do differently? All right, you can answer that in two minutes. That would okay. be great. And then, how can the Kalamazoo startup community you know help uh, Rhino Media? Okay, um, two minutes. Uh, the question was, what would I do differently? Okay, I don't always know how to answer these questions. I don't think like that a ton. I just think like, I always am doing things differently. Like, I, I start with the assumption that I did it wrong the first time, but I didn't blow it up. It wasn't terrible, I'll fix it. I always think about fixing it all the time. So doing it differently, I don't always know how to answer it. It's not like one big huge mistake or, you know, I think maybe, I don't know what I wrote down, but I think it was something like uh, I would have paid more attention to like uh, clarifying roles and things up front and like, down. yeah, writing things down. I mean, that's part of the numbers thing. I like to keep it all hovering around in my mind, um, but like getting it on paper and making sure things are communicated clearly. The, the more we grow 
um, the harder it is to make sure all the information is disseminated to everyone and people don't feel left out and the right hand needs to know what the left hand is doing. Um, that was a pretty complicated move. I just pulled out. Proud of that. Yeah. Yep. So, um, you know, that whole part of it's important. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I don't have any. Like I said, my thing is. Uh, Values and beliefs, you write those down. Yes, yes. Having, the, having those values and beliefs kind of written down. Like I said, I, it's almost, I think about it as like sometimes like when your company's new, it's almost like you're in the progression of like oral language, written language, and then we have the freaking printing press or whatever. And now we're, in, you know, that's what it's like. It's like we're telling stories all the time, writing on the cave. That's how we do stuff. And over time, then we write it down on a piece of paper and hand that out. And then it just goes along the whole, you know, how that whole thing went. But, um, yeah. So, what was your other question? The last one: How is the Kalamazoo Star community able to help you? I have no idea how to answer that question. I don't. It sounds weird. I don't want to sound like I'm a hero, but like I never know how to ask. I don't ask for help a lot. I don't know how to say like, here's what you can do to help me. So, what do you mean by that? When we talked about it, you actually said you wanted people to start cool companies. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's an answer. I'll do that. Um, <laughs> so, for me, like. What the startup community can do to help me, sounds a really weird way to say this, but I would just encourage everyone to, it's a line from an Avert Brothers song, but decide what to be and go be it. Like, don't sit there and just wait for your moment to happen, American Idol style. Like, do it. Like, just start doing it. And don't be afraid. Um, don't be afraid to ask for help. Don't be prideful. Just go about your thing and start doing it to the best of your ability. Because that's, I mean, there's never been a better time to do something that you love and make money off doing it. And, and, if, and if your product's good or your service is good, you'll, it'll grow. If not, don't be too prideful and say, well, why doesn't anyone like me? Screw the world. That's their fault. Like, no, it's your fault. Fix it. Figure out why it's not working. Not to look at you right then. I don't even barely know you. But, um, you know, like, if it's not working, there's a problem with you. Don't blame the world. Fix it. And if, and if your service isn't picking up any traction, maybe there's some tweaks you can make. Maybe ditch it all together because maybe you're not good at that. Um, and uh, just don't don't look for reasons to not do it. Just start doing it. And the more we cultivate that culture in Kalamazoo, the more good things can come. And I'm telling you, uh, four years ago I had zero influence in society. I mean other than the high school kids, I had zero influence in society. Not that I have a ton now, but now it's like, you know, uh, I'm on a committee for downtown Kalamazoo, whatever. It's like the marketing events committee, which sounds like something, but it's just like, these people want my input and they listen when I talk. And that's crazy because a few years ago, I feel like I was the same guy, but I was sleeping on a couch and no one cared um, what I had to say. And so, when you just go after something and, and, and um, be committed to your beliefs and be committed to who you think you are, um, people care and they listen. So um, I would just say go at it and don't make excuses for why you can't do it. Just start doing the thing you need to do. You know what I'm saying? So that's what I would say you can do to help me in some Very weird good. way. I want someone to make a restaurant that's all bacon themed. I want to do it, but I don't think I'm going to do it. <laughs> So I'll do that. Let's give it up for Kevin. Thank you. Thank you.